everyone, thanks for joining us today. One of the things I want to talk about is, and I see it time and time again, churches get confused by it, the laws behind it are confusing, it's taxes. Everybody hates that word. They're especially confusing and complicated when you're dealing with churches and pastor salary, staff salary, and stuff like that. Jesus tells us to give unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and give unto God what is to God's. Now, we need to back up for a minute, okay? Tax exempt doesn't mean you're exempt from all taxes. As a church, as a tax-exempt organization, there are certain taxes you have to pay, certain taxes you don't pay. I've worked with churches that are paying taxes they shouldn't, not paying taxes they should. Here locally, there was a church that believed that tax-exempt meant exactly that. You were exempt from all taxes. They weren't submitting the withholding taxes to the IRS or the state. They get a letter from the IRS saying that they owe taxes. The IRS literally showed up at their door. And through looking at paperwork and everything, the IRS made the determination that the pastor of the church was the responsible party. And if the church couldn't afford to pay the taxes, she had to. That was simply a matter of paperwork. She was in charge of everything. I don't know what happened to them. I think they ended up, or at least the pastor ended up filing for bankruptcy. But it put them in a very tough spot. I have learned through working with clients, talking to pastors, bookkeepers, all this other stuff with churches, that there's information passed down from person to person to person. That information is not always correct. Sometimes it's incomplete and it's missing stuff. So today we're going to set the story straight. Tax exempt simply means that you don't pay taxes on your surplus at the end of the year. It doesn't mean, and it surprises me how many churches and nonprofit organizations have this belief that they can't have money left over at the end of the year. Like they have to like not make money. If you're not operating in the positive, there's no room for growth. You can't buy new bulletins. You can't hire people. You can't do all this other stuff. And the next thing you know, you're, you're constantly having fundraisers to do what you, to do an event. Listen, you're allowed to have money left over at the end of the year. Tax exempt just means you don't pay taxes on it. The taxes that churches don't have to pay are you don't pay federal unemployment taxes. You don't pay state unemployment taxes. You don't pay property taxes. Now that the property tax side is a little bit confusing. You don't pay property taxes as long as you're using the property for tax exempt purposes. Okay. So if you have a church and you own that building and you're using it to conduct church services, you're tax exempt from that. You're not paying property taxes. If you have land that is undeveloped and it's just sitting there, you will pay property taxes on that until you have something built and you're moved into it, and you're using it for the tax-exempt reasons. Okay? Now, in most states, I know here in North Carolina, it, it's not when a, when a tax-exempt organization buys property, it's not automatic. It's not, there's, there's additional paperwork you have to fill out. Here you have to fill out to be recognized by the county, tax department as tax exempt, that a tax exempt organization owns that property. If you don't do that, they're going to assess taxes on it at the end of the year. And here in North Carolina, they're a year behind. So you'll have to pay the first year taxes. And then you fill out the application to be considered tax exempt. And going forward, you, you should not pay property taxes on that. You're also exempt from sales tax. Again, it's not something that's automatically done. 
you'll fill out a form with the Department of Revenue and they'll do one of two things. You have two options here. They'll give you a letter that says you're, you're exempt from sales tax. You can take that and give it to all your different vendors that you buy stuff from and they won't charge you sales tax. The other thing you can do is keep track of your receipts and the Department of Revenue will reimburse you your sales taxes that you've paid twice a year. You just have to keep up with the receipts. The other taxes that you're, and again, there's, there's paperwork that you have to fill out to be able to do that. It, it's not automatic. You have to ask for it. They're not just going to give it to you. Okay, there's, there's all these forms that you have to fill out to get that. When it comes to property taxes, some states are different. So please check with your state, check with your county. I work with churches that pay property taxes and they're primarily in uh, common law states such as, such as Pennsylvania and Louisiana, where they pay property taxes on a portion of the building that they're renting out. And then they, they pay state or city income taxes on the portion of revenue that they generate from renting that out. Each state's different, each state has different requirements, but as a general rule, as a tax exempt organization, you're exempt from property taxes. The other taxes, the one one of the things that are it's confusing, and a few years ago there was all this media press over a parking lot tax. That was a little bit different. That's called unrelated business taxable income. Okay, what this church was doing, they was renting out their parking lot to the local businesses for parking spaces. They were doing it with a cons in, a, in a consistent manner. And it was consistent, it was regular, and they were making money from it. Unrelated business income is taxable. One of the key things to look at with unrelated business, does it take on the look and feel of a retail establishment? For example, if a church has a cafe, and we see them a lot like in, in the mega churches, they have cafes. Some of them are only open during church service. That income is probably not taxable for the church. It's exclusively for the church members. It's not open to the public. There are some that the cafe is open seven days a week to the general public. That income could potentially be at minimum reportable. They may have to pay taxes on it. There's a lot of different things that, that go into play with that, especially if you're paying your employees to be there. If you're paying people to be there, they're selling it to the general public. It has the look and the feel of a retail establishment. It's consistent. It's ongoing. It's not just a one-time thing. That's probably taxable income for them on that portion of the income, the bottom line income that they make. That's one of the most confusing tax laws for nonprofit organizations What at, at of any of them. The other one is rent. The IRS recently changed that up until 2000, I believe it was 19. If you were a tax exempt organization and you were renting your space out to, to another, whether you were renting out your sanctuary to a church on days that you weren't having church so they could get started, you were renting it out to AA, NA, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, whatever. As long as that building wasn't encumbered with debt, for example, you didn't have a mortgage on it. You didn't have to pay taxes on it. That has recently changed. Now, all rent, whether it's encumbered by debt or not, if I'm reading the law correctly, is at minimum reported on your, you would do a 990 I believe it's a 990 INT to at minimum report that income, whether you pay taxes on it or not. That's a little bit of a different story. It depends on how that law reads. Again, I would check into it. I will 
check into it and, and keep you guys updated as I get more information about that. One of the most confusing things I think when it comes to salary is, is pastor's pay. I get asked that question constantly. Pastors are taxed a little bit differently. They're taxed as employees, but they're also taxed as subcontractors, as independent contractors, sole proprietors, whatever you want to look at it. Their salary, their, the base salary is taxable for federal employment, federal withholdings, Social Security, Medicare. The housing allowance is exempt or it's taxed. Social Security and Medicare is withheld from the housing allowance. Federal income taxes is not. I'll be honest with you. I may have it backwards, but it's not subject to all taxes. So a portion of that housing allowance is subject to self-employment taxes at the end of the year. I work with pastors and every year they have this conversation with their church because the church doesn't withhold taxes. They don't withhold federal taxes and Social Security and Medicare. But they add that 13%. Okay, Social Security is 7 point, Social Security and Medicare is 7.65% for the employee that's deducted from the employer's paycheck or the employee's paycheck. Another 7.65% that the employer contributes. But they, for whatever reason, they add 13% into the pastor's salary. And what that does, that creates a higher tax liability at the end of the year for the pastor. The church believes that they're doing the right thing and they're helping the pastor out because they are putting that 13% into their paycheck. But if they add 13% to it, they're not taking taxes out. So they're actually increasing the, the liability. The best way to do it is just have the taxes withheld. Ministers do have the, the option of opting out of Social Security and Medicare. Personally, I don't know why anybody would do that. It makes no sense to me whatsoever. You're not paying into Social Security. So when you retire, you can't draw from it. There is a two-year period. You have two years to opt back into it. You know, a big one for me is love offerings. And again, it comes down to information being passed from one person to the next. You know, one pastor asks somebody else something and they're, they're passing on this information without knowing all the details behind it. Love offerings are taxable income is taxable income. You have to report that. He said, but the church doesn't give me a 1099. They don't give me a check. They just give me cash. Regardless of how you get it, whether it's cash or a check, it's still taxable income. It's still reportable income. The church doesn't necessarily have to give you a 1099. They should but it's still your responsibility as the pastor of the church, the guest speaker at a church, to do the right thing. The Bible tells us that we are supposed to do all things as if we are doing it unto the Lord. The Bible tells us in Romans that all authority is ordained and approved and appointed by God. And we are to follow that authority. Tax exempt does not mean you are exempt from the laws that govern them. Going back to salaries, this actually happened to, to my wife. She was working for a church-run daycare center. And the church treated all the employees the same way they treated the pastor of the, of the church. And they weren't withholding the, uh, the, all the, the right taxes. At the end of the year, she had to pay extra taxes because the church wasn't holding enough. The Social Security and the federal withholding taxes, whether it's the federal, the federal income tax, Social Security, Medicare, those only apply to clergy members. It doesn't apply to the lay members of the church. Okay? It's just the clergy members. Now... Speaking of clergy members, 
there's also requirements because we can't, you know, as a pastor myself, we can't say everybody's clergy member for the different tax breaks, the housing allowances, the all that other stuff that they get, right? I mean, we can't do that. There are requirements for that defines a clergy member in the eyes of the IRS. And again, they're there to protect the clergy members and make sure that you know, people aren't taking advantage of that. They have to teach. They have to preach. They have to perform sacraments. Communion. And not just once a year. Look, you can't preach once a year and give sacraments once a year and say that you're a, a clergy member legally. Right? I mean, if we're doing things up and up, if we're doing things the way that we're supposed to and we're abiding by the laws that govern us, then that's kind of, that's wrong. You know, and these are things that I've seen. These are things that I've witnessed. You know, these, these, these tax laws and these requirements, you know, they're, they're there for a reason. You know, I've worked for a ministry that was paying the, the, the founder minister that did all the work. They were paying his rent. They were paying his car payment. They were paying his utility bills. They were paying his cell phone bill. Car insurance, car payment. But he wasn't getting a salary. Now, in this case, and, and it happens, probably more than I would like to know. These things, those extra support that he's getting from his ministry are fringe benefits. Usually, fringe benefits are not taxable or they're taxed at a lower rate. But because he didn't have a salary attached to it, those benefits that they're paying for, those fringe benefits, the car payments, the utility bills, the rent, all of that, those are taxed as self-employment. Those That becomes the wages, and that subject to taxes. The danger in that is th there was another a music, uh, a, a guy that ministered through music, and his ministry did the same thing. They send this ministry a letter that says because they were paying 100% of his expenses, they were reclassed as a for-profit corporation. They lost their tax-exempt status. I'm not saying that we don't support our pastors, right? The Bible says that we, we give the laborer their due. We don't muzzle the mouth of the ox. Things like that. So I understand that perfectly fine. Churches are not, any tax-exempt organization is not subject to unemployment taxes. You don't pay federal unemployment taxes, and in most states, you don't even pay state unemployment taxes. Most states have a reimbursement policy for, for tax-exempt organizations. Basically, what that means is, is if you are, if you have an employee, you let them go, whatever, and they qualify for unemployment, and they file a claim, and they, and they're entitled to the unemployment payments. The state will pay the will pay the, the the benefit out, and then the church reimburses the state. With for profit businesses, it's the other way around. You pay uh, state unemployment taxes every quarter. <coughs> Excuse me. Federal unemployment taxes, depending on the amount, is either every quarter or every year. It's all based on the amount of wages you pay. With tax-exempt organizations, as churches are, you don't pay federal unemployment taxes. You don't pay state taxes until after the fact. You have the option to pay them, but it's not required. Okay? Now, the trick with that and the key with that is you have to remember, nobody likes getting letters from the IRS. They can be intimidating. They can be scary. And, and I get that. 
I'm working with a church right now that every year we have to f send in a federal unemployment tax return with zero amount due. Simply because when the church first got started and they brought staff on and they, they had the ability and the means to pay salaries, they were, the, their payroll company was paying unemployment taxes. They find out five years down the road that they've paid these taxes unnecessarily and stop filing their reports. The IRS sends them a compliance letter that says, hey, you know, we're kind of checking in on these unemployment taxes that you haven't paid in a few years. So we call the IRS, let them know, hey, we're tax exempt. And, you know, the, the rep that we were talking to said, okay, fine. You know, you, you don't have to pay them, but just, you know, send in a zero, zero amount due tax return every year because we've got them in the past. So they're kind of like a creature of habit, right? Once you submit one form, you have to keep doing it. And it's hard to not to get them to, to change that sometimes. Work together or, or don't work together. The IRS, look, they make mistakes. I've, I've had to call them. I've probably spent more time on the phone with the IRS these last five years than, than I would ever care to. They do make mistakes. They're willing to work with you as long as you're willing to work with them. I mean, if you call them all upset with an attitude, you're, you get what you give, right? They're there to help and they will help. I've spent hours on the phone with one IRS agent over an issue that was their mistake. Now, there was a lot of paperwork and stuff we had to go through to get to that result. But they are there to help you and they will take their time to help you. When you get a letter from them, they're going to tell you what it's about. They're going to give you a tax form, whether it's a 940, 941, 990, 9, whatever. They're going to tell you what quarter and what year. It's your job then and your responsibility then to go back and find what they're looking for. See, you want to be prepared when you call them. It makes the conversation a lot easier. You know, so just kind of, I mean, and again, everybody kind of freaks out when they get those letters. I had a church I'm working with. They get this letter from the IRS and they call me and they are, I'm, I'm telling you, they were in a panic. And I, I told their bookkeeper, I said, you know, calm down. You know, we'll, we'll work through this, but we got to see what's going on first. And I asked them, I said, just out of curiosity, you know, what's, what gives? You're extremely upset about this. The church down the road from them, and this is what he told me, he said the church down the road, there were five different three-letter agencies that showed up, and they were taking stuff out in boxes and all this other stuff, and like, like on a TV show, right? And I told him, I said, look, that's not just IRS stuff. They were doing something way bigger than that, right? So just, you know, and that's why knowing this stuff is so important, knowing these tax laws and these, especially when it comes to payroll, you know, you, you, you gotta get that stuff right. Even if you have a payroll system, you know, that system is only going to work and spit out the information that you put into it. You know, if you have that set up wrong, you're not taking the right amount of deductions or, you know, whatever, that information is going to be wrong. And then you get into a little bit of problems, right? So make sure that if you have that payroll system set up, that it's being used correctly. When it comes to pastors, make sure, you know, and again, it comes back to love offerings and, you know, well, what happens if I go to another church? And I'm speaking at another church, or if I do a wedding, or I do a funeral, or whatever. That money is still considered taxable income. Legally, you have to report it. There's no getting around. Let me take that back. There's no legal way 
to get around that. Okay. I've actually had people ask me to do that, how to do that. How do I not pay taxes on these love offerings? Well, you kind of have to. Well, the church didn't give me a 1099. They don't have to. They should to protect them for documentation purposes. But even if they don't, you still have to pay it. There are certain allowances that aren't that you know that aren't subject to that. Right, but you know, just we're, we're supposed to do the right thing. So again, thank you for joining me today. Thank you for your time. I hope you guys have a great rest of the week, a great weekend. I hope you're in church. Spirit-filled messages. God bless. We'll see you soon.